The last shall be first, Russ. I'm always amazed when that happens. You know, you sit and wait, you look up. Good evening and welcome to St. Mark's College, the Catholic Theological College at the University of British Columbia. I'm Peter Meehan, Principal of St. Mark's, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening for a talk by Professor Santa Ono on liberal arts in the 21st century, more important than ever. The community of St. Mark's at UBC is comprised of St. Mark's College, St. Mark's Parish, and Corpus Christi College. And together we are the legacy of more than 90 years of continuous Catholic presence at the University of British Columbia. At the Catholic Center of the University, we serve the needs of Catholic higher education at the UBC and in the province through our undergraduate and graduate degree programs, continuing education, and public lectures. As the only faith-based undergraduate institution at the university, we're also committed to meeting students of all backgrounds where they are on the journeys that are life and faith, and to serving roles at the university that are both unique in terms of our Catholic Christian identity and programs, and complementary in preparing students who will go on to complete degrees at the University of British Columbia. Tonight's public lecture responds to the increased pace of technological changes with the values embedded in the liberal arts, forming enlightened, socially conscious citizens through critical thinking, empathy, personal integrity, and intercultural literacy. At the same time, if the liberal arts are to retain their relevancy, they must be understood by each generation for their value, not only to the marketplace, but, but to borrow from the words of Jean Vanier, whose memory we are honoring at the college this week, to becoming human. In his talk, Professor Ono will discuss the importance of the liberal arts to UBC and to society in general, and why liberal arts colleges such as St. Mark's and Corpus Christi are more important than ever. The Carr Lecture is co-sponsored by the Newman Association of Vancouver, who have a rich history of promoting Catholic religious, intellectual, and social activities on campus. At this time, I'd like to invite the president of the Newman Association, Michael Goko. Those who know me know that for my day job, I work at the Faculty of Education at UBC as part of their admissions team. So I'm really glad to be here with the president of UBC, not just as our keynote speaker, but really ultimately my boss. So I gotta behave here. Follow the script. Founded in 1940, the Newman Association of Vancouver continues the mission of the Newman Club, which was founded here at UBC in 1926 to serve Catholic students of the university. Our activities strive to promote and cultivate the religious, intellectual, and social formation of its members and associates. We are happy to be co-sponsoring tonight's event. The annual Carr Lecture celebrates the legacy of Father Henry Carr, founder and first principal of St. Mark's College, and a former chaplain of the Newman Association. A member of the Congregation of St. Basil, Basilian Fathers, Father Carr is a pioneering figure in the history of Canadian higher education, including his work resulting in the Federation of St. Michael's College to the University of Toronto in 1910, the founding of the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies in 1929, and the Federation of St. Thomas More College to the University of Saskatchewan in 1943. At the invitation of the Archbishop of Vancouver, William Mark Duke, Father Carr came to Vancouver in 1951 to discuss the idea of an affiliated Catholic college at UBC, which is with one of Professor Ono's predecessors, Professor Norman McKenzie. Ultimately, this resulted in the creation of St. Mark's College in 1956. Father Carr remained at St. Mark's into his final years before passing away here in 1963. In 2012, Father Carr was designated a person of national historic significance by the federal government. And this year, in recognition of his achievements, Parks Canada installed a memorial plaque outside Carr Hall at the University of Toronto. Thank you.
So before we get started, and before I introduce our featured speaker, our honored guest, a few housekeeping items. Washroom access is via the elevator or stairs to my left. In terms of photography, there's one official photographer on site. You're welcome to take photos from your phone, but please turn off the ringer and the flash. Due to popular demand from individuals who are not able to physically join us this evening, we are live streaming and recording tonight's lecture. Thank you to everyone who is enjoying this uh, talk this evening via live stream. Engage with us, in, with us on Twitter through the lecture by tweeting with the hashtag liberal arts. Following Professor Ono's address, there will be time for questions. As a courtesy to the audience, please keep your questions brief and to the point. You'll be, yeah, well, there's a reason why we say that. <laughs> You'll be invited to direct questions to Professor Ono from the microphone, which I believe is, it's, I was told to point to it, it's there, but I'm sure it'll be prominently placed. We're pleased this evening to have a renowned speaker and an honored guest, Professor Santa J. Ono with us. Professor Ono is the 15th president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia, a global center for research and teaching with more than 64,000 students, 16,500 faculty and staff, and a $2.5 billion operating budget. He is also a professor of medicine and biology and chief advisor to the British Columbia Innovation Network. If I went on further about his background and his extensive CV, we would be here all night. Suffice to say, we are so pleased to have with us tonight, Santa Ono. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for being here on this uh, beautiful day. I know that there are many other things that you could be doing today, so I'm very honored with your presence. And um, I hope that uh, some of the things that I will say today will be of interest to you. Uh, I am personally looking forward uh, to the question and answer period uh, and to hearing from you about your views about this very important topic, about the importance of the liberal arts uh, in the formation of young minds. Uh, it's something that I personally feel uh, very passionate about. Some of you may know that uh, I was an undergraduate student at the University of Chicago in Illinois. And some of you may uh, um, know that it is uh, considered to be one of the bastions of, of a liberal arts education, uh, something that didn't uh, start there, uh, certainly at, at University of Chicago, because it's a relatively young school in the history of post-secondary education uh, with the liberal arts uh, model of education starting much, much earlier uh, in Europe uh, and in Italy, as you know. So, uh, but it's an institution that's passionate about that model and, as you know, uh, has a core curriculum that's really uh, committed to reading the primary literature uh, in a set of subjects that are generally considered to be the liberal arts, and they include sciences as, as well, as you, as, as you may know, including subjects such as mathematics and the natural and physical sciences, as well as the humanities and social sciences and the visual and performing arts. So when I speak about the liberal arts, I speak about that entire broad swath of, of, of human scholarship and research and endeavor. Um, and it is, uh, in, in my, my view, really fundamental uh, to uh, becoming an educated human being and citizen, uh, someone who can take uh, um, learnings from each of those disciplines to integrate them and to uh, learn how to think critically and to integrate information and be prepared for many different vocations uh, because of what they've learned uh, from that broad-based education. It's really an honor for me to be here uh, I'm proud that uh, the University of British Columbia and St. Mark's have been associated for over 60 years, while we've partnered with Corpus Christi for almost 25 years. And I truly believe that St. Mark's uh, and Regent and uh, Corpus Christi um, play a very important role in this uh, community of scholars. I believe personally, and some of you may know that, that uh, nurturing uh, multiple faiths is something that's uh, incredibly important uh, for the formation of young minds and also for older minds as well. Um, I really enjoyed being here 
on Easter Sunday at St. Mark's for a beautiful service, and I was incredibly moved by that service. So I'm very, very grateful, not only for this opportunity, but for St. Mark's being here as part of the community. UBC and St. Mark's shares a lot of things. We share scholarship and resources, students and faculty. We share a common commitment to scholarship and service to humanity. Some of you may know that in our newly endorsed and approved strategic plan for the university as we've celebrated our 100th birthday, we've called that strategic plan shaping our next century. And many of you may know that uh, one of the, 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 the core values of that strategic plan are to inspire through teaching and research for a better world. And I truly believe that the liberal arts is fundamental for a number of reasons that I'll get into to focus our efforts individually and collectively to use the multiple talents that are uh, present in this great university to really focus on using that for positive ends, to focus on, on the really vexing grand challenges that face us as a civilization, and to use the broad-based knowledge that is present in individuals through a liberal arts education, but also throughout the academy to try to solve very difficult problems, such as geopolitical tensions that exist and seem to be growing, as well as uh, problems such as renewable energy and, and climate change. St. Mark's and Corpus Christi both have a stellar reputation for the liberal arts in different kinds of education and in some overlapping fields. It's something that you should be proud of, whether you're at St. Mark's or at UBC, and yet today we find ourselves having to often, too often I say, defend the value of a liberal arts education. I've spoken about this at a number of different venues at the American Council on Education. I'll speak about it uh, tomorrow at Quest University, um, founded, some of you may know, on the uh, focus on the liberal arts education by a predecessor of mine, David Strangway, who founded Quest University. And, um, and so uh, it's, it's rather odd, a number of people think, that uh, I, a scientist, um, often talk about the importance and write about the importance of liberal arts. I've, I've done it at the AACNU, American Associations of Colleges and Universities in North America. I've talked about how the liberal arts need no defense. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later today. But I want to start by quoting uh, one of these critics. And the critic says, the social sciences are fighting for life. The humanities against death, what is certain is that neither is properly adjusted to the educational and social needs of the modern world. This is, these are the words of a critic. I repeat, these are not my views. I, I actually argue against this person in different venues. There's nothing unusual about the statement except that it was written and written by many people since that time, but the original words were written in 1964. First written then, 55 years ago. I was a toddler at the time. So obviously people have been predicting that humanities and the social sciences have been doomed for a long time. And those of you who've been in the academy know that people have been criticizing the liberal arts and the humanities and social sciences for a long time. These critics include politicians, increasingly. And it makes me stay up at night to hear what people say, to hear the kind of uh, messages that are propagating not only from politicians, but also from certain kinds of media that shall remain nameless. <laughs> they dismiss the liberal arts as irrelevant in the 21st century, and I'm here to argue the opposite that they've never been more important. And they suggest that universities and colleges should concentrate on producing STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics graduates, rather than historians and scholars and literature in similar fields. In fact, it's not only the politicians, it's not only certain uh, media outlets, it's also entire nations 
that I last are taking this view. Some of you may know that I hail from a Japanese ancestry, that I came here to Vancouver and British Columbia because my Japanese father immigrated to North America and joined the faculty of the Department of Mathematics here at UBC. And so I'm very saddened to, to, to know that uh, a number of universities in Japan, and in fact some politicians in that government, are questioning the importance of the liberal arts in that nation. So there's much to worry about, and it's for that reason that we need to speak out about the importance of the liberal arts. I do so not only because of my position at a university that has tremendous strengths in the liberal arts, but because I firmly believe that whatever I have accomplished, it's because of my foundation in a liberal arts education at the University of Chicago. I believe I'm a better scientist. I believe I'm a better uh, administrator. I believe I'm a better teacher. I believe I'm a better father and husband and I believe that I am a better uh, scholar because of my liberal arts education, because it was intentionally diverse and heterogeneous, because it made me move outside of my comfort zone into areas of thought uh, and discussion that were uncomfortable to me, because it broadened my mind. It exercised my mind. I certainly agree that Canada and the world needs more graduates in the sciences, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I don't dispute that. In fact, many of you may know that the province of British Columbia have, has invested significantly at UBC in expanding the number of seats in STEM disciplines, in disciplines such as computer science. I don't dispute that. I'm not anti-STEM or anti-technology because they are needed in the modern world. What I'm here to say is, at the same time, we still need the liberal arts, now more than ever. It's for that reason that I am very proud that the University of British Columbia is really, in many ways, an outlier. Where many universities south of the border, in other continents, are actually closing down programs, decreasing the size of the Faculty of Arts, in my most recent conversation with Gage Averill, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts at UBC, he is on a remarkable hiring spree. We will grow the liberal arts when it is actually decreasing in other institutions and other nations. It gives me great pride. <laughs> that applause should be for Gage and the faculty and administrators of the Faculty of Arts. I'm just here to report that that's happening. I want to give you a couple of examples. First, uh, just a few weeks ago, the world watched in horror. I watched in horror. As the steeple of the Notre Dame Cathedral toppled and flames engulfed the historic building, who didn't gasp? Did you see the images from the news of Hundreds of thousands of Parisian individuals watching in sadness, in horror. Immediately, a number of questions were being asked, some of them disturbing, some of them appropriate. How do we make sense of such a tragedy, certain people asked. Why did this fire get so much attention compared to the destruction of other holy places and relics? Sometimes, perhaps a difficult question, but difficult questions are appropriate in universities and in a liberal arts education. Why did donations to restore the building flood in when other worthy causes go neglected? Should France rebuild the cathedral as it was, or should it also use the opportunity to re-envision the Notre Dame Cathedral for the 21st century? As France and the world grapples with these questions, the humanities, philosophy, religious studies, history, architecture, art history, and more, even the sounds of the organ in that cathedral, 
should help inform that conversation and the difficult decisions around the difficult questions. You see, if we had a world of only STEM graduates, imagine about the loss of perspective one would have in answering questions such as those. A second example, as you know, is that we just observed Earth Day. It's held to raise awareness of the dangers of environmental destruction and climate change. The same week saw the publication of a book, Losing Earth, The Decade We Could Have Stopped Climate Change by Nathaniel Rich. I encourage you to read that book. It's on my summer reading list that I'll actually release to the community uh, in the near future. I urge you to read it. It's compelling narrative about climate change and the chance that we have to save the Earth, that we had to save the Earth three decades ago. That's rather sobering if you listen to it. The wor words, the chance that we had to save the Earth three decades ago. As you know, a number of individuals, both old and young, increasingly young, fear that the time has passed where we can do something about climate change. The offer author of Losing Earth was not a climate scientist. He was a liberal arts graduate. I would argue that his humanities background helped make his message even more powerful because his liberal arts education gave him the critical thinking skills and the perspective to bring home the poignancy of our lost chance, I hope not lost, I don't agree with him on that matter, to save the Earth's environment. These are just two examples out of many that show that the liberal arts matter more than ever before. A third example. I'm a biologist. And some of you may know that something remarkable has happened here on this campus. A beloved scientist and molecular biologist who passed away, Michael Smith, some of you might have known him, won a Nobel Prize for something that changed the world. He was the one who invented the technique of site-directed mutagenesis, the ability to repair and to change nucleotides in, in genes that might be responsible for inherited diseases. Something remarkable. Most recently, you may know that uh, a molecule had been discovered by a number of teams internationally called the CRISPR-Casp molecule, something that can be used to, in a very specific way, uh, edit genes. Tremendous technology. The other thing which is happening in front of our eyes is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Things that are awesome in their power, but also something that brings to civilization great risks. So in the case of CRISPR-Cas, as you know, it can be used potentially to address individuals that have been genotyped and, or identified to be prone to develop certain diseases that are heritable. So it can be used as a powerful way to bring health to individuals that previously had been, through their genotype, predestined to develop certain diseases whether they're cardiovascular, whether they're blinding eye disease. And these are areas where my laboratory actually investigates age-related macular degeneration. And working with patients that have lost their central vision because of macular degeneration, I can say to you it is exciting that this technological and scientific advance might pave the way to prevent blindness in the leading cause of blindness in the Western world. Some of you may have loved ones who are losing their vision or who have lost their vision because of AMD. So that's one positive aspect of, of this progress. But there can be a very evil and sinister use of these powerful technologies as well. Think about it. Someone who is very wealthy might be able to take this technology and perhaps give an unfair advantage to their progeny 
so much is known about the genome, one might be able to engineer a son or daughter that is a tremendous athlete. They can run faster, jump higher, play hockey better than your neighbors. It can be also used for biological warfare to harm other individuals, something that actually is happening. If you think about the use of neurotoxins and other biological warfare agents that are being developed because of the progress that has been made through individuals with tremendous knowledge in the STEM disciplines. You know, one of the things that I say when I welcome new students to UBC and also say farewell to them 36 times in different convocations <laughs> in the upcoming weeks is to remember the motto of UBC, to a mest. It has a double entendre. One is, it is yours. And what I usually talk about is your education, this beautiful campus, the memories that, have, that you have of your time at UBC, it is yours. But the second meeting of to a mest is, it's up to you. And what I usually talk about is, the blessing, the gift of having a world-class education at a place like UBC. I don't know if everybody, all of them crossing the stage at graduation, truly understand the blessing that they have received and the fact that a very small percentage of, of humans, of people, have that kind of opportunity to have an education at an institution with faculty members and staff and facilities that come even close to what UBC offers. So I want them to understand the blessing of having been able to obtain such an education, the privilege that comes with that. But then I say, the other meaning of 2MS, it's up to you, is in many ways, I think, something that can only be grasped if you have a liberal arts education. See, it's up to you whether you use technology such as CRISPR-Cas or machine learning, artificial intelligence, or Ponzi schemes if you're in commerce. It's up to you how you use that knowledge, whether you use it for helping others, addressing the most vexing grand challenges of the world, or whether you use it to enrich yourself at the expense of others. That's what I believe to a mess means. Not that it is yours and that you own this information, this knowledge, this privilege, but it's up to you whether you realize the blessings that have been given to you and not to others. And it's up to you whether you make the right decisions, large and small, to be in service of others. That's what I try to impress upon students when they arrive and when they leave. And so what does that have to do with a liberal arts education? Well, I talk about another sort of common phrase. Those of you who have heard me speak have heard me say it before. I talk about the education of the mind that you obtain in reading books and listening to professors in lecture halls if you're a STEM graduate, the education of the mind that you receive in laboratories, that's one kind of an education. But I argue here that what you learn from the liberal arts goes well beyond that. It's not just about being able to integrate information from multiple fields and to be able to think critically and to go beyond memorization to original thought. Those are things that are discussed all the time when one talks about the liberal arts and how they're important. What I, the, the primary reason that I think the liberal arts are so important, more important than ever before, is because it is through the understanding of the liberal arts, through the study of civilizations long past, the listening of music and thinking about how art moves you. 
thinking about very difficult philosophical questions, that you get a different kind of education. It's not an education of the mind, it's an education of the heart and soul. And the last thing I say to graduates, and those of you who have seen me at graduations know this, is I say, when you have to make a tough decision, always go with your heart, not with your mind. So there's two kinds of education in the liberal arts, I believe, are fundamental because they set the stage for being wise because you follow your heart. You see, the essence of it is that we need the liberal arts to help make sense of the world. A world that we live in today, but a world in many ways that you can understand better if you think about people who came before you who have grappled with the same issues of identity, who have grappled with other climate issues. We're not the first species or civilization to deal with climate change. As you know, the dinosaurs are no longer here. We can learn from the natural sciences that are part of the liberal arts. We can learn from that. Some might say, why study fossils or why study what happened in geology. You can learn so much from understanding what's happened in the history of humanity, but also in the history of planet Earth. We can learn so much from exhibition of hatred and greed and prejudice that have happened in many different centuries, in many different parts of the world. And if we truly commit ourselves to a liberal arts education, we can hopefully learn from that and avoid doing it again. But hopefully you recognize that we as humans make the same mistakes of prejudice and hatred over and over again. And if we have post-secondary education or, or primary or secondary education or graduate education that is only STEM and is devoid of history and the arts, devoid of philosophy, devoid of every aspect of the liberal arts, I worry that we will make the mistakes over and over again even more. In the age of runaway technological change, and I really think in many ways it's accelerating, the humanities can give us the critical thinking skills and the perspective from history to deal with these issues. We need to learn from the wisdom of those who went before us. My colleague and friend, Joseph Aoun, president of Northeastern University, a university which is renowned for applied knowledge, for being one of the largest work-integrated learning or co-op universities in North America, recently wrote in his book, Robot Proof, that the humanities are more important than ever as the pace of technological change increases, and I agree. I mentioned a little bit artificial intelligence and machine learning and automated cars. These things are happening. UBC and other universities are at really the, in many cases, the cutting edge of this technological change, and we are proud of it. And I'm not saying that it is bad. But the reason why the liberal arts are more important than ever before is because the pace is increasing so rapidly that I worry that we are not thinking about the consequences of that technological change. Because I worry that we are not developing the education of the heart sufficiently so that we can recognize the risks that come from technological change. So that we are so focused on numbers and rankings that we forget about our commitment to serve and to serve those that are far away and who might be less privileged and we forget about those who are less privileged right here that are together with us. It's that kind of education of the heart which is at the center of St. Mark's. It's the center of believers and it's at the center whether you're a believer or whatever faith you might believe in, whatever religion you might follow. 
the education of the heart is really shared among each of those faiths. Allow me to quote a little bit more from my friend Joseph. He says, quote, intellectually, morally, and spiritually, the humanities are among the most fertile grounds on which to nurture a complete human being and citizen. He doesn't say that it's in chemistry or physics or mathematics that you nurture a complete human being and citizen spiritually. He says it's in the humanities and the social sciences that you nurture a complete human being. Complete in not just your mind, but also in having wisdom in the heart. Those are my words. They form the foundation of a life well lived and the furnishings, listen to this, of a civilized mind. One of the things that I often say is that a liberal arts education is not only important to be a good human being and citizen, but it is also important in being a global citizen and a servant leader. Joseph says, no matter how much we rely on technology, we still need to deal primarily with humans. How lonely would it be if our lives were yourself and a machine? Quite boring. They're interesting. And to be frank, I worry about a lot of these kids are just looking at their iPhone all the time. But true happiness, I believe, comes from interpersonal relationships with other humans. And he says, even the engineer needs to consider human interfaces. And even the programmer must learn to be a storyteller. And I'll get back to storytelling and the importance of that, whether it's oral storytelling or whether it's storytelling through images or through music. I'll talk a little bit about how important that is to intergenerational education. Some critics might respond that, well, that's all very nice. For most students, majoring in the humanities will not lead to a rewarding career. Some parents worry, will my son or daughter make enough money if they major in, a major in European history or in philosophy? Well, a number of studies have uh, taken place. Some of you may know of them from the, the Mellon Foundation and many, uh, many other uh, very reputable surveys and, and studies. And they actually show that although perhaps in the early years after liberal arts education, you might not make as much money as an engineering graduate, that if you actually look at many of the leaders of Fortune 500 companies, not that that should be an aspiration, or leaders in, in many different uh, vocations, the ministry, um, the arts, Disproportionately, many of the leaders have had a liberal arts education. And I say that's not an accident. It's because they've learned how to think critically. It's because they've learned to be creative. It's because I argue that they have more than an IQ. They have an EQ as well. That's not exactly true because EQ is probably inherent, but that uh, perhaps it shows that you have received that education of the heart, that kind of education that you lean on when you have to make a difficult decision, when you're not quite sure what's right and what's wrong. I believe that individuals with a liberal arts education are successful because they have developed that wisdom of the heart. Some critics might respond that those statistics might not be crystal clear. But I can tell you that I've looked at many, many different studies of the long-term prospects of liberal arts students, that I have looked at them at institutions that I've served, including the University of Cincinnati, where I was president. And looking at many, many different data sets, I can tell you that liberal arts graduates are very successful. Here are some of those statistics. 55% of the world's professional leaders are social sciences and humanities graduates. Humanities graduates are just as well paid as those in the sciences. 
10 years post-graduation, the average humanities graduate earns as much as the average mathematics or natural sciences graduate. Employers want the skills that humanities graduates have. According to a study of Canada's largest employers, employers value soft skills over technical knowledge, especially relationship building, communication and problem solving skills, analytical and leadership abilities. And I can tell you I get to speak with lots of Fortune 500 CEOs around the world and increasingly they're telling, telling me we can train our new employees in, in what they need to know in terms of programs and what they need to know in terms of the nuts and bolts of what they're doing. We can take a bright person and train that person. But what we want more than anything else is that person that is original, that is a critical thinker, that can integrate information, that can actually, uh, when confronted with a novel situation, has been there before, just like a liberal arts graduate has been when they've read something or thought of something that they've never thought of before. These attributes that are developed and refined through the studies in the social sciences and humanities are exactly what Fortune 500 CEOs are now looking for. But we cannot feel complacent about the importance of the humanities. Even if they're going to grow at UBC, they're shrinking elsewhere. I would be complacent and I would not be fulfilling my responsibility in talking about what I fervently believe if I was satisfied with what's happening here at UBC with a blind eye to what's happening elsewhere at other institutions. Now there's one other thing that I should say and that it's not just that people like myself and others like Joseph should talk about the importance of liberal arts. Another example is a, a friend of mine, Bud Peterson, stepping down as president of the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, one of the top engineering schools, technology schools in the world now. Well, as you may know, that institution did an experiment. So if you're a, a STEM graduate and you might uh, question the accuracy of surveys and in studies of, of longitudinal studies of individuals. Georgia Tech actually did an experiment. They took two cohorts of engineering or applied science students and they gave one cohort a traditional STEM curriculum. And the other, co uh, the other uh, cohort they actually exposed to an intentionally liberal arts kind of a curriculum that because of accreditation standards had the same assessment of competencies required to be an engineer or a designer, but also uh, had additional courses layered on called breadth of knowledge courses. Those of you who are in such disciplines uh, at UBC or at SFU or, or other universities know that we have breadth of knowledge courses at UBC as well. But that early experiment showed that uh, although a lot of people predicted that um, asking STEM students to take liberal arts courses, the classics, social sciences, philosophy, music, having them watch ballet would distract them and would actually negatively impact their performance. It showed the absolute opposite. Giving them the liberal arts education they were significantly outperforming those that had a exclusively STEM curriculum. And more importantly, more importantly than the performance, when they were focus grouped, if you will, that's not a real word, if they were questioned and surveyed afterward about their satisfaction with their education, those that had a liberal arts component embedded in their STEM education were much more content as well. So both those of you who like such studies that are really designed as experiments, you can see that there's clear evidence in the same institution with students accepted by the same admissions criteria that having a liberal arts component has a definitely positive effect, even longer term than those that had STEM-only education. 
Cardinal Newman once said that the purpose of liberal knowledge is to prepare graduates to fill any post with credit and to master any subject with facility. In this day, that would mean classical studies as well as law, literature, history, and philosophy. But today will also include computer science, communications, and cultural awareness. I'm heartened to see that in addition to the liberal arts being integrated in certain places into a STEM education, that we're also thinking about what is a liberal education? What is a liberal arts education? Does it need to be exactly the same as what Santa Ono received at the University of Chicago in 1980? So the other thing that I say to professors that have embraced the liberal arts educational model is that we also have a responsibility to think about how we can improve that education. As demonstrable as it is that it has a positive effect on, on graduates, both in STEM and non-STEM disciplines, it doesn't mean that we can't improve it or listen to the student about how that education might be more obviously relevant to their educational experience. One of the things that you hear in, in speaking with students in the humanities or the social sciences is that sometimes, or music students, is that sometimes they, they, they don't understand the real world relevance of what they're studying. Sometimes they wonder, why is it that they should be reading Thucydides, Thucydides or, or Plato's Republic? They don't quite see the connection to their own lives today. And so we need to do a better job of thinking about articulating that, thinking about the entire curriculum, um, and thinking about how to make it clearer the benefits that they will receive from reading the primary literature. I'm heartened to see that liberal arts colleges such as Corpus Christi and St. Mark's are adapting, and that the University of British Columbia is adapting. If you look at the calendars for these institutions, you'll see courses, even though they're focused perhaps primarily, and this includes Quest as well, you will now see computer science, economics, film studies, psychology, all kinds of courses, standalone courses, but also interdisciplinary courses. And the course content in other traditional liberal arts uh, courses and disciplines like philosophy, political science, history or biology, and mathematics, and chemistry. I had professors from Science One and Arts One talk to me over the past couple of days. They are thinking about how to evolve and change the curriculum and how they teach to align with the expectations of the digital native, to think about how the knowledge that uh, students are obtaining in their formation is relevant to their everyday life, to reflect new discoveries and new challenges that didn't exist when I was in university. The humanities are changing at UBC as well, as I said. Let me give you a few examples. UBC is increasingly emphasizing experiential learning. In fact, I gave a whole talk about experiential learning at the 15th annual Teaching and Learning Conference at UBC Okanagan. I believe that for the liberal arts, experiential learning means integrating traditional liberal arts skills and curricula with certain opportunities to apply that, not necessarily to technical situations, but to situations that students might encounter in their everyday life or in their future life, whatever vocation they might choose. I'll get back to that and expand on that in a second. For example, it's to give students tools in the digital humanities and the computational social sciences. Integrating these kinds of developments that didn't exist when I was in university are very important for current students to feel that they have the same tools at their disposal while they're studying humanities or the social sciences to address current problems, as similar as they might be to problems of people of, of the past. 
We continue our efforts at UBC to increase the number of experiential learning opportunities for UBC students through things such as international learning and student mobility, internships and co-op placements, service learning, research, leadership and professional skills development in a variety of settings. Liberal arts students at UBC are encouraged to embrace co-op work experiences in the arts, arts co-op. UBC's cooperative learning program, largely based in arts, uh, arts co-op in the Faculty of Arts, represents one of the largest such uh, co-op programs involving the arts in all of the Western world. And it has provided, in recent years, students and employers with more than 6,000 work placements annually. And this is work placements in every conceivable kind of situation. In theaters, in symphony halls, in companies, in law firms, where they are able to apply what they're learning in the liberal arts to those different settings where they are confronted with situations that they haven't seen before and where their liberal arts education, employers say, brings a different way of thinking to what might, in some cases, be an exclusively STEM environment. UBC collaborates with the community and industry and government and university partners to provide a variety of transformative learning experiences to students. And the university has integrated experiential learning opportunities across a wide range of programs, including the liberal arts, to make them more accessible to students. Here are a few more examples, and then I'm going to actually try to sum it up and move into the question and answer and the conversation mode. I've mentioned Arts One and Science One. Arts One is an established eight-month program, as is Science One, that features learning in small groups. I think it's very special for a number of reasons. It was pioneering, as was Science One. It features learning in small groups, they have their own spaces with an integrated interdisciplinary curriculum. Much of it, not all of it, is a liberal arts curriculum. But as I have mentioned, there are connections with medicine, with uh, many uh, real world issues such as ethical issues in, in, in commerce. Arts One is very special because it has really pioneered a different way of thinking about the liberal arts, and we should be proud of that. If you think about a specific field, for example, we offer numerous interdisciplinary programs. Our Asian Studies program, which is one of the world's best, it alone offers 15 such interdisciplinary programs. Interdisciplinary not just within the fields of humanities, but also interdisciplinary with departments and programs in many other faculties. It's this kind of uh, interdisciplinary evolution of the liberal arts, this experiential component in some cases, that students have told us brings what they're studying in the liberal arts alive and makes it clear while they're studying that they're learning something that will help them in a variety of different vocations. These programs bring humanities and social sciences and often science and creative arts students and faculty together. At first, it's not easy. It's sort of like mixing ponies and dogs and cats all together because we all know that if you study uh, different things, if you're perhaps into the visual arts, you might be very different from the typical solder student in business. You might be very difficult from the typical, dif different from the typical applied science student. So what we've found here and elsewhere is that when you bring together students and faculty with different interests and different passions together, initially, it's not very easy. They have to get over their differences. They have to learn how to interact with people that think differently and view the world in a different way. But after an initial probationary period, if you will, it actually becomes magical bringing together humanists and social sciences, individuals in the STEM disciplines. What they, can, what they can do together is extraordinary. We tried that at the University of Cincinnati where I came from prior to coming here. 
we recognize that in the first term, that an interdisciplinary uh, setting, that in the first term, things didn't go very well. But if we were persistent and helped them get across cultural differences in individuals that are focused on different uh, disciplines, and if we help them get over the different languages that are used, and we actually encourage them through example of the benefits of interdisciplinary teams, that ultimately what occurred were that they were able to produce solutions to a whole set of problems that were in many ways much more diverse and in many ways superior to answers and results that came from a homogeneous group of students and faculty. When you have these kinds of programs, they tend to focus on an issue or a topic, a wicked problem, if you will. And what we found through the studies of many institutions that bring interdisciplinary liberal arts together is that they tend to produce solutions that are attractive not only intellectually, but also uh, of interest to the corporate sector. Case in point, when we brought together interdisciplinary teams, including humanists and social scientists, and asked them to think about things like, what would make for a better airport? What would make for a better way to load an airplane at a terminal? And you looked at, did an experiment of, if you have only engineers, what kind of solutions do they come up with? Or if you add humanists and social scientists um, that think about design and aesthetics and uh, wellness, they come up with many more decisions, some of which are much more attractive than those that come from teams that are only STEM graduates. So if you provide these kinds of opportunities to students while they're in school, they understand the benefit and the value of a liberal education while they're learning. And it gets over that concern that they often have that what they're learning might not have real world relevance. These are just a few of the ways that UBC keeps the liberal arts relevant, why we continue to experiment and think about how to keep it attractive to the students of today. As I said earlier, the world faces major challenges, poverty, inequality, violence, prejudice, climate change. And I believe that the solutions to these wicked problems require global citizens global citizens that are informed by a liberal arts education, global citizens that are committed to serve, global citizens that have an education of the heart, not only of the mind, so that we can face those challenges. I truly believe that the liberal arts today are more relevant now than ever before. Just as the liberal arts were relevant in Cardinal Newman's time, they remain relevant today, and they will be even more important in the years ahead. Now, I want to talk to you about one last thing before opening it up for questions and answers. Seems like I'm okay for time. Is that okay? Well, we try very hard as an institution to think about how to bring the liberal arts to, to many different uh, problems. I want to tell you a little bit about something that I did today that really moved me as an individual. I think one of our biggest responsibilities at UBC, situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Mus Musqueam people, is to be a leader in the truth and reconciliation process. It's not just what I believe, it's what's in our strategic plan. It's what has come out of about 15,900 responses to what should UBC do in the next century. I'm proud that that's something that has come, risen to the very top of what people think UBC should accomplish. It's not that people feel that we shouldn't have disciplinary strength. It's not that people think that we shouldn't have world-renowned faculty members and students winning all kinds of honors. It's not that we want to stop doing that. But if you think about what I said at the very beginning, about how blessed we are, and I unabashedly use the word blessed, 
With that comes responsibility. And there are many wicked problems. But if you think about the blessing that we have here to be situated on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam people, then we should harness that wisdom of the heart, the wisdom of the mind, to be leaders in reconciliation around the world. There's a lot that we should be proud of. You know, we, I was visited earlier this week by the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Queensland. All kinds of people come to UBC. And one major reason that they come to UBC is because they want to know what are we doing about truth and reconciliation. And let me say very clearly, there's so much more we have to do. It is truly a wicked problem. But it's also an opportunity. Well, what happened earlier today is that um, I was invited to go on a, on a bike trip around campus. You should do it sometime. It's a beautiful campus, especially when it's not raining. <laughs> and so I got on my bicycle, and I started near the Allard School of Law. You might notice in front of that School of Law is a wonderful pole. Well, that pole has a history. It has a story. It's someone, that pole signifies a people that before there were so many trees could look over the Salish Sea. It tells the story of peoples that lived here for millennia before there was even a thought of the University of British Columbia. And so I took all that in. There's a history of the pole. There's a history of the people. There's a history of the conflicts that occurred between peoples. And then I got on my bike and we went to the second stop. And some of you may know that now there's this glorious nest, the AMS building, one of the largest student unions in North America. It's very nice. But next to it is a, a smaller uh, sub, they call it, student union building. You know what I'm talking about. It's been renovated. It has a subway. It has... Uh, things that I couldn't even imagine when I was going to university, the things that students have today, it's pretty remarkable. But next to that is something called Brock Hall, which was the first student union. Some of you may have danced in those, in the, in those buildings when you were students. In front of there is a Thunderbird, a mythic um, um, icon or figure that means so much to First Nations and also to, to the University of British Columbia. As you know, our, our sports teams are called the Thunderbirds here on this campus. And I stopped there. And the, the point is that UBC has spent a lot of time thinking about preserving the languages, languages being a central part of the liberal arts. It's taken a lot of time to, to honor the First Nations, and we need to do much, much more by putting up Poles. Most recently, just a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, the reconciliation poll to make everyone remember the history of residential schools. It's art. Art that's there to make us pause and think about the history of what happened in the residential schools. And what UBC has done at each of these different stops. And I encourage you to look it up. You can see a map of the whole campus and there are little orange arrows. Everywhere there is a piece of First Nations art. And each of those has a story. And that's what you learn in the liberal arts. You learn about history, you learn about the mistakes of the past. You learn to not avoid truth, but to embrace truth and try to make amends, to redress the wrongs that we as humanities, as, as humans, were involved in and things that we should really embrace for the reconciliation process. So hopefully that illustrates to you the power of the liberal arts. 
if we commit ourselves as we must to thinking about the past, to be inspired by art and music, to make sure that the liberal arts are always part of a university education, then we can solve wicked problems such as the truth and reconciliation process. I want to thank you so much for spending time with me tonight. Thank you. So we do have time for questions. Michael is going to uh, set up the microphone over there. And if you have questions, maybe you would be interested in speaking from the microphone. While you're waiting to prepare a question, I have a question. Um, as I look around the room, I'm, I'm just so honored uh, to have so many friends and colleagues in this room, including friends from the other denominational colleges here at the university, including Cary College and the Vancouver School of Theology. Um, in talking about the importance of the humanities and the education of the heart, I know this is something that's been very important to you, um, to have these theological affiliates of the university. Maybe you could talk a little bit about why that's important for you. You know, I said that I was very moved when I came to Easter service here. I was very moved because, um, you know, I go to different kinds of churches depending upon where I am. And I'm actually very moved by the, the different uh, services that occur in, in different churches. What happened here was uh, the cross was actually laid. That sounds like myself. <laughs> <laughs> the cross was actually laid on, uh, um, actually it was not Easter, it was before Easter, the day before Easter. The cross was laid. And we all had an opportunity, one at a time, the whole place was full to come to the cross, to kiss the cross, to think about Jesus' uh, sacrifices of, of his own life. That's so important to me as a, as a person. I wouldn't be who I am today were it not for Christ in my life. For those who don't believe, please uh, give me that opportunity to say that. It, it means so much to me. And I know that it means so much to faculty members and staff and to students. Um, I think that just as I shudder to think about the academy without the liberal arts, I shudder to think about an academy, even if it is a secular institution, as UBC is, that doesn't have opportunities for faculty, staff, and students to nourish their soul Faith is so important um, for so many in this university. And that's why we are very, very fortunate to have this college and other affiliated faith colleges uh, on this campus. Be beyond wellness and um, the importance of faith uh, in being a whole person, uh, I also believe that religious studies studies of theology are really one of the defining features of what it means to be human. And so even if an institution is a secular institution, I believe fervently that the Bible should be studied, that different religions should be studied, because there's extraordinary wisdom in the Bible, for example, and in other faiths as well. And so not studying that is actually ignoring uh, one of the repositories. And it's a living discussion. But just the Bible itself, ignoring the wisdom and the history in the Bible would be a great failing of any great university. Oh, yes. I'd like to okay. invite you up to here at the microphone. And for the rest, you can also start lining up if you do have questions as well. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Professor Ono, for that uh, very insightful and inspirational talk. Um, I'm a graduate of UBC, so I go back eons, probably even before you came. Um, and I'm also very much involved with what goes on here at St. Mark's. 
And one of the things that I strongly believe that the university is failing in is the fact that I think that to graduate in STEM, it would be nice to make some course or whatever in social studies an absolute requirement. So when I came from the West Indies, for instance, and we were trained in science, we all had to take English literature. And you could make straight A in physics, chemistry, and biology. And if you failed English literature, you did not graduate. And so one of the things that I think that I would really, really think is a challenge to the university, and this too a mess, and your predecessor, Stephen, too, a place of the mind. It would have been nice for him to say a place of the mind and of the heart. And I think you get that with what you've alluded to, which is experiential things. So one of the things that I think really would be helpful is the university, as a social leader, took on this added social role to make sure its students have to go out, and I think if they had that kind of an encounter, a lot of hearts would be changed, because ultimately, what it is about is making the world a better place. So I, I'd like to hear your comment on that, and maybe you can tell us the impact of Shadow Play. Oh, thank you so much. Well, first thing is, uh, I don't know, you've been at UBC for a long time, uh, and so undoubtedly, you're aware that uh, the president and vice chancellor of a university has absolutely no power. <laughs> And any president and vice chancellor that, that thinks that he or she has, a, has power will be in trouble very rapidly. Um, as you know, um, universities uh, are governed by the University Act. And I'm going to get to a, a real serious answer in a second. But, but just to paint the landscape for some people who may not be familiar with universities as you are, that they're governed by shared governance, that there are two bodies, there's a board of governors, and there actually are two senates one here in the Vancouver and one in the Okanagan. And so making change, as much as what you say resonates with me, is not on one person's shoulders. And it's not an excuse. Um, and I will talk a little bit about how we might get to where you think we should go, which I don't disagree with. You know, any changes in curriculum um, can't come from the top. They have to, in, in, in many cases, they come from the students themselves. And one of the things, the bright lights I see is that, that you can see in the current university students and those that are coming up from secondary schools, one thing that uh, I agree with about the, the immediate past president of the United States, Barack Obama, who was here and spoke at the Vancouver Board of Trade, is that as vexing as the problems are, the wicked problems are that we have to face, as depressing as it is to turn on the news and, and see nations and leaders look inward and to uh, build walls and not bridges, no names will be mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> that he, uh, the reason why he still remains optimistic is because uh, the, the youth um, actually have an intuition about what needs to happen. They come to me. And in some cases, for example, Johns Hopkins University, you may have heard that for a month they've been sitting in in the office of the president. Not saying that I want that to happen here. <laughs> but, but it's happened before. But the reason why they're doing that is because they demonstrate abundance wisdom of the heart. Um, their complaint is, and I'm not judging Johns Hopkins or Ron Daniels there who I, who I adore. It's a very difficult situation. But that conflict has to do with their uh, concerns about uh, racial profiling, uh, with the, the creation of, of a university police force. And of course, it's a, it's, it's a challenging area. There's quite a bit of crime. But you know, it, ex it exhibits the, the, the wisdom and the heart and the empathy that they already have within them. Some of the changes that are occurring in engineering schools around the world, some of it's coming from administration, but some of it's, a lot of it's actually coming from the students themselves, saying there must be more to life than, than linear algebra and trigonometry and, and physics. Uh, and so uh, I'm optimistic in talking to the students themselves that uh, they're going to push for that. And... I will be supportive, but it ha there are a couple more barriers. One is that um, 
nations uh, and professions have their own accreditation standards that give more or less degrees of freedom to what can actually be in a curriculum. And those of you who are in education know that's the case. All of these are just facts. They're not excuses. Um, and hopefully you could hear from what I'm saying that we're on the same page. Um, it's possible to do it. The fact that the, a College of the Liberal Arts was created at the Georgia Institute of Technology indicates that, that there's room for such change. The fact that there are more breadth of knowledge courses at UBC and the fact that I've, I've met with uh, uh, engineering directors and applied science deans across Canada and across uh, North America that are passionate about this also makes me um, optimistic that these changes can occur at UBC as well as elsewhere. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you for your enlightening, enlightening and encouraging talk. I'm Paula Price uh, from the Department of Anthropology and I'm also associated with VST. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'd love to hear your view on the problem of um, disappearing tenure track jobs and how courses like uh, liberal arts are increasingly being taught by uh, sessionals, sessionals yeah. and how those sessionals are in a unstable and precarious uh, situation in terms of how they're supported and how they're paid. Um, how do you think that affects our need for the liberal arts? And if you see there's a problem there, what would you say these solutions are? Thank so you. it certainly is a problem, um, and um, it's a it's a it's an issue of of equity. It, it reflects, and I'm not talking about UBC. I'm talking about across um, most North American universities. The trend has been towards more and more sessionals and fewer 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 and fewer tenure stream positions. I believe it's a problem. I believe the fact there's uh, much more of that in certain fields than other fields. Um, can be interpreted as and, and may reflect um, different values that individuals or institutions have for the liberal arts, for example, relative to STEM. Uh, and so the first answer to your question is yes, I believe it's a problem. What are we doing about it at UBC? Uh, we will relatively soon be uh, releasing a comprehensive, comprehensive analysis of, of faculty uh, lines and and representation um, in, in the relatively new, near future. Um, I've been here for about two and a half years and I mentioned that there'll be significant hiring of uh, net new positive tenure stream faculty, not only in the arts but across the entire institution. It's something that cannot be addressed overnight, but those steps that we're taking to increase in more tenure uh, stream faculty and to move away from the previous trend of moving towards sessionals as opposed to tenure stream is something that we're committed to doing. It's going to cost a lot of money. One of the first things that I've done um, in my first two and a half years here is to really think about how we might uh, resource this, what the business model would be. It cannot be um, on uh, constantly increasing tuition. Um, that's not sustainable, and we have a uh, ethical responsibility, a moral responsibility to do everything we can for an education to be affordable. It's certainly much more affordable here than in the U.S. My my daughter is in U Hill Secondary, went to the NACAC uh, University uh, Fair at the Vancouver Convention Center. You'd be shocked. I went to the, the University of Oregon. As much as I love the Ducks and the University of Oregon. Please don't quote us. I guess this is being streamed. It, U of Oregon is no UBC. <laughs> I, I said it. <laughs> and I asked them, how much does it cost uh, all in? And the response, I don't know if it's going to shock you, is 54000 U.S. dollars per year relative to 7000 Canadian. So, but nevertheless, it, it is a fact, and that's just tuition. There's more if you pay live-in residence. I know that it's much more than that for Canadian students, don't get me wrong, and much more for international students. So we do have to be mindful for cost. So there are real things that, and it's my job to do this, as well as the provost and the deans, 
to figure out how we can change the business model, and it can't be done on a dime, but we're going to do it in a sustained incremental way to move back to a higher proportion of tenure stream and fewer uh, sessionals. Now, that brings to the next question, what do you do with the people who are sessionals? Then we have to really think about how to support them better, and that also has uh, a financial modeling component. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm committed to doing it. I spent a lot of time in the first uh, couple of years to think about how to finance it, and we're starting to address it. It will take a little bit of time. Uh, hi, I was a university student here last year. Uh, I did a major in history, and then my... Welcome back. Thank you. It was very <laughs> good to see you again as well. Yeah. Uh, for my capstone seminar course, actually, we were taking a look at uh, Christian and Indigenous First Contact, and so I wrote my final research paper uh, on this topic of Indigenous voices in their contact. And so, and I know this is uh, a topic very... Uh, very hot amongst my peers as well, speaking also as a devout Catholic. Uh, you mentioned that it, there is uh, a much greater plan to invest in the Truth and Reconciliation movement and uh, developing that further. I was just wondering if you could expand more on that maybe and uh, provide a little bit more clarity into what that would actually look like moving forward. Sure, that's a great question. Um, you know, I really am proud of what's happened and what UBC does in preserving languages, uh, in, in really having a large amount of, uh, uh, in collaboration with First Nations art on campus, and, and, and not having token art here and there, because that's really actually worse than having no First Nations art, but um, really making sure that we tell the story and honor the people that have been here for millennia uh, through those art objects. Um, and it's, it's, it's also very important for us to continue to preserve the languages and invest more in that because the languages are beautiful and we're losing them. And um, through those languages, stories are told um, through oral storytelling, which is uh, extraordinary in its accuracy from person to person. You know, if you take a typical group of people here and say one thing to this person and they tell the stories, at the end, it'll be a totally different story. But one of the magical things, as you know from your studies about First Nations, is the, the accuracy of oral storytelling. And part of that is, uh, and this is as from, spoken as an immunologist, <laughs> but um, that's one thing that's very striking to me um, from my exposure um, you know, in my brief time here, is that we have a lot to learn from First Nations. So, Investing uh, and to ensure that we are a leader in, in preserving the languages, but also expanding the opportunities for embedding uh, First Nations culture and perspective into every faculty is one thing that we aspire to accomplish. Earlier today, I was in uh, the Jack Bell building, the School of Social Work, and I was very moved because their, their actual faculty shield or emblem is First Nations art. And a lot of this art, as you know from your studies, involves a raven. Um, there are two places on this campus where um, I would say the profound thought of First Nations is captured. There is a place near SCARP, um, near, near, near the SCARP, the education building, I don't know if I said it right. Um, and in this, in this little, very obscure place, there is a wood carving that has a raven. And it has a sun next to it. And I might get this wrong, but I think that uh, what it has to do with is the raven bringing the sun to Haida Gwaii. And what's really moving about that um, is that next to that very old art is... Uh, are, are two uh, um, quotes, one from Helen Keller uh, and the other from George Peabody. They talk about enlightenment. And uh, if, if you think to the significance of the art, the First Nations art, it can be viewed, as, as is the case with many First Nations art and stories, 
with a double or triple entendre. And one is just bringing light um, to Haida Gwaii, but the other is enlightenment. And for that reason, in that faculty, that art, which can be studied in a liberal arts course or context, is relevant to enlightenment in general. And Helen Keller, as you know, having been sight blind, um, um, she has a very moving quote about the importance of enlightenment in an informed human being and citizen. Very relevant to what we've been talking about today. So my dream, to answer your question, sort of a very roundabout way, is that we do much, of the, much more of that. So not just in education and social work. In social work, it's a raven. Uh, and uh, in the middle is, is a human. It, it morphs from, from a raven to a human. And raven is very common in First Nations art, signifying the importance, I think. Um, and there's a human. And so social work really revolves around uh, really working for the betterment of many people who are underprivileged. And so what I'd like to see is, uh, and there's a lot of this going on. It's, it's remarkable. In this bicycle tour that I did, that you should all do, by the way, <laughs> um, you, um, we, we came across a whole class. So there's a professor called Sarah Hunt. She was a whole class, and they had all these articles, and they were going, as I was on bicycle, um, they were going from to pole to pole to pole, thinking about the history, the story, the significance of each of those things. I want every student at UBC to experience that. I want every student, because you know, one of the, I would say, biggest mistakes about the definition of global citizenship is they think that it's about how to be a citizen in relation to places far, far away. I think one of the opportunities in embedding liberal arts into the University of British Columbia context is the opportunity to be a global citizen to communities like First Nations that cohabit and actually preceded our presence on this land. So what are we going to do? Well, we have a strategic plan called Shaping Our Next Century. We have committed to trying to really be a beacon in the truth and reconciliation process in the UNDRIP uh, recommendations. And uh, in the first year of allocations, the biggest investment that we've made, the largest number of funded projects has, has been uh, to truth and reconciliation related projects, to embed that in undergraduate research, to support uh, faculty members that are proposing uh, new uh, programs of research related to First Nations and indigenous studies. So that's my dream. Um, to, to create a roadmap for that dream, a very important part of the university's strategic plan, which is now in its final stages of vetting and consultation, is a new indigenous strategic plan. My predecessor, Stephen Toop, really pushed this as well as, as he did with respect to uh, environmental studies. And, as a result, I think I, I, I really want to give a shout out to Stephen Toop for, for uh, with a relatively modest investment, um, really helping to move UBC to the forefront of answering these questions and these challenges of, of, of climate change and of, of, of the truth and reconciliation, truth and reconciliation process. Um, what I want, when you please read that indigenous strategic plan, we are committed to continuing to invest uh, to uh, not only maintain, but hopefully increase our impact uh, in these very important issues. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm a uh, graduate from BCIT, uh, Diploma in Architectural Building Technology, and a recent graduate from Capilano uh, in the 2D Animation and Visual Development Program. Uh, I guess consider these uh, two credentials as um, more career oriented and now in contrast to um, uh, your talk uh, which advocates liberal, liberal, liberal arts uh, um, and especially after this talk I, I, uh, I want to advocate for liberal arts as well. But I think my concern is um, um, first of all like the reason why um, I would prefer a career-oriented program. Our schooling is um, is to you know like 
I guess, earn eventually just to be forward. And I was wondering, and also considering like um, tuition tuition hikes, uh, that I think, I don't have statistics with me, but tuition hikes, I, I was wondering if that's been a concern with um, whether students have been pursuing liberal arts less um, due to tuition hikes, and if that, um, has that affected the student, like has that affected the um, applications of how many students you're, you've had? And if it has, like, um, do you have any thoughts or proposals on how you could kind of like overcome that or approach? So approach let me try to, to parse out your comments. Sure. The first is, it's never too late, even mm -hmm. after you have your credentials, to immerse yourself in the liberal arts education. It doesn't right. have to be a degree program. Uh, this gentleman talked about how important the cello is to me. If were it not for my ability to play the cello, uh, I would be a much more frazzled and uh, stressed out individual. Um, I'm constantly benefiting from the liberal arts through my analysis of music, mm -hmm. which changes the same piece of music, the same box suite. This is a digression, but please, yeah, yeah, as a cello yeah. lover, <laughs> oh, okay, the okay. same box suite, the same movement, the second suite, the prelude, I'm constantly studying that. I'm constantly listening to how other people interpret it. I'm constantly trying to think about what Bach is trying to say. And that enriches my soul. So I want that for you. And I think that in your first comment, you're saying, I heard it, I get it, I want to support it. Uh, it's not too late. It can be art or film or music for you. I want that for you because I think that I have not met a single human being that's not positively affected by reading a book, listening to music, painting. In fact, our medical researchers in the Faculty of Medicine are showing indisputably that engaging in the liberal arts will result in healthy aging. So for your own well wellness, it's not too late, you can always embrace that. Second question has to do with something about tuition increases. Are we seeing an impact on applications to the arts versus the science? Applications to UBC are through the roof. Um, the Faculty of Arts, as I said, is growing. It's an anomaly. Um, I'm not sure why, but I'm very happy. And if it was actually, if there were fewer applications, I would personally go to other universities and say, study the liberal arts at University of British Columbia. But we're not seeing a decrease. It's one of the largest faculties. Um, I think part of it has to do with innovations. Mm -hmm. Arts one. Um, new kinds of programs. A new policy school. Um, it has something to do with uh, uh, arts co-op. The fact that faculty members are innovating and realizing what students want and listening to them that we're an anomaly. We have lots of applications. Your middle question about tuition hikes, does it worry me? Yes. And it's for that reason that the increases while I've been here have been kept to a minimum relative to previous years. Some of you may know that prior to my arrival there was a very large increase in international tuition, 15%. And uh, if you've been following, we've been hearing from students and governors that there better be a good reason for significant tuition increases. For that reason, we went down a 2% uh, increase, which is far below the increase in the expenses to run the university. And so it does matter to me a great deal. But it does not seem to be impacting the number of applications. Now, the devil is in the detail. What we don't know is whether the applications are going up but the kind of student that might be applying might be different. So if you look at very expensive schools, liberal arts colleges like Williams or Amherst, or elite privates like uh, Harvard or Vanderbilt or Yale or Stanford, um, some of them have very generous uh, financial aid and scholarship bursary programs. Some of them don't. What you find in the institutions, because the other thing I study is the world of universities, is that if you don't have considerable financial aid or scholarships or bursaries, then you may get a lot of applications, but it might not be diverse. It might be very wealthy, well-to-do individuals from, from a, a wider geographical location. So an anomaly in the Ivy League schools is 
even though it's very expensive, what you're finding is that you're getting more and more people applying to the same elite schools. So although the number of applications to the whole sector may be going down, you see that they're focusing on trying to get into a certain kind of school. It's also true in, in Canada and British Columbia, for that matter. Many of the other institutions in the system in BC cannot fill their seats, whereas the number of applications to UBC are very strong and in some cases growing. It may amaze you that uh, uh, last year, um, people who read applications to UBC, and by the way, I'm very proud that it's a more holistic than most Canadian universities in that responses to questions are actually read, not just um, a single mark. Um, it may amaze you that 77,000 complete and incomplete applications were read by people who read these questions. 77,000. So there's no shortage of applications Great. to UBC. It's good to hear, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the very long-winded answer, <laughs> but he had three questions. <laughs> you know, I believe Oscar Wilde in yeah. one of his literary works stated that a cynic knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Being one who's taught accounting and finance here for the last quarter century, it's been adopted to say that accounts know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. You and I and most everyone in this room probably knows the value and appreciates the value of a liberal arts education. But I know that, and I know that there are financial constraints, is that academics who teach liberal arts are paid less or significantly less than ones who teach, for example, at the Sauter School of Business, in medicine and dentistry, et cetera. So how is a society and as an institution Although we value something, we're not willing to pay that price. I understand market forces for dentistry services, medical services, et cetera. But what, what thoughts can you offer on that? How to reduce that gap? Thanks. Well, you're absolutely right that um, the huge uh, salary differentials that exist in all of North American society, uh, the argument for them are, are the market differences. So. Um, you know, who can justify that someone that kicks a ball around the field is worth, worth 36 million pounds? Uh, and someone who teaches uh, our beloved children makes much, much less, uh, uh, not even a fraction of that. Um, and so this is a, a problem, an issue of all of society. Um, we can't solve it for all of society. I have no influence on, on the premiership. Uh, but um, I do have some influence on salary disparities within institution. Um, as was the case with the question about the proportion of tenure stream versus sessionals, um, there's a realities of, of the budget um, and uh, um, available resources. So things can't turn on a dime. This is, UBC is sort of like a, a huge armada of ships. And, um, and so, it's not straightforward um, to um, change those sorts of things on a dime. But it is possible to change those things um, through um, bargaining, and those things are occurring as we speak. Um, those things come up in bargaining. I can't talk about specifics because we're in the middle of bargaining. You can understand that. Um, and that's a good thing. You know, a lot of um, university presidents um, are scared or, or shy away from the existence of unions. I actually support them because unions actually really play a very important role in addressing those kinds of issues, those inequities. So universities can, to answer your question, look at data and look at those disparities and try to, in, in, in an incremental way, sustainable way, address those. So that's all I can say. Um, it exists. Um, we look at those disparities, we look at disparities in salary between genders. Uh, we know information now because we're doing a deeper dive than ever before about differences in compensation in different faculties. They won't be addressed overnight, but we can uh, think about how to address them over the next uh, several years to decades. We just have yeah. the last two people. Oh, sure. Hello, Dr. Ono. Um, let me simply thank you and get to the question because we're here to hear you talk and not me. So <laughs> uh, my question is, um, 
what do you see and foresee uh, with UBC as leading and working with other colleges and universities, including Corpus Christi, in terms of developing this movement of liberal arts education in post-secondary settings? Thank you. Well, one of the um, very exciting things that I can report on is that um, UBC is privileged to be invited uh, to be part of consortia, international and global consortia. Um, and uh, relatively recently, I was invited by um, um, the Prime Minister of France, Macron, to visit um, his residence in, in, in Paris. And, and the reason is that um, you, mean, you know there's one leader that talks about make uh, a certain nation great again. Macron has a slightly different variant of that is make the world great again. And he um, is pushing something um, as the current president of the G7, something called the U7. And um, the whole purpose of that is to think about curricula, to think about international partnerships, to think about the opportunity through education to develop global citizens that have empathy, um, that um, are thinking about how uh, across borders we can work together to uh, solve uh, issues, um, very difficult issues. Um, he's convening us together, and, and UBC and I have been one of the early universities uh, invited to be part of U7, which is University 7, which are from the G7 nations. The idea is to expand well beyond that seven uh, nations to include nations from around the world, because one of our responsibilities in global citizenship is to share our know-how and to partner with institutions that are in much less privileged parts of this world. So hopefully that gives you an, an answer. Um, there are ways that, um, that we can come together um, to, um, to harness the education of the heart, the wisdom that comes from liberal arts, that we can espouse it and we can share it uh, with people who may not have access to such an education. Uh, we can travel, we can offer our service, um, and we can uh, um, really show the passion and, and, and lead through example. So hopefully that gives you some sort of an idea. There are many, many uh, possible examples on, on how one can do that. I have to say that one of the biggest threats that I see is this phenomena of fake news and this sort of... Uh, attempt to quash um, evidence-based um, information. Uh, and one of the, I think, most important uh, responsibilities of a university is to be a guardian of uh, true news and evidence-based information. Uh, because uh, access to, to, to true, true news and information uh, really as a, is at the heart of uh, democratic institutions and, and, and nations. And any force that tries to, to, to veil or to cover the eyes of the public to the truth um, actually shackles them and works against democracy and freedom. One more question. Hi, Professor Ono. Uh, I'm an exchange student from Singapore, and uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's really a nice campus. Thanks for being here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think my, my question today is, uh, um, I, I'd like to get your opinion on what you think about uh, university campuses in North America. So, um, like, issues about popping up uh, people being overly sensitive, political correctness, uh, safe spaces and stuff like that, and how um, actually truth has not, has become less and less objective and more relative um, in the eyes of different individuals and groups. Um, I'd like to get your opinion on um, this worrying trend, I guess, um, where truth has not become objective anymore, and uh, how you see, it, uh, especially now, given that university campuses are now kind of hotspots for these kind of ideologies and thinkings? It's a, a fantastic uh, question, and I can tell you, I, I live that uh, dilemma. Um, I've lived it for several years. Um, believe it or not, this is my ninth year as a senior administrator. Uh, I was a president of a previous university, and 
I'll tell you that um, I often say to people who say they want to be a university or a college president that you need to have your head examined. <laughs> because, um, you know, these are uh, small cities, large towns. Uh, during the day, I'm going to answer your question in a second, believe mm -hmm. me, but um, there's a reason why I'm trying to, to paint the magnitude of the issue. The issue is a local one, but it's also a global one. It's a very important question. But on any given day, there are about 80,000 people on UBC campuses. Whether there are 50-something thousand students here, over 16,000 faculty and staff, as you heard, there's another 10,000 uh, students in the Okanagan and more faculty and staff there. We would be Nanaimo <laughs> if we were a city. Um, and we have people living on campus that don't even study or work here. And so this is uh, a big responsibility. There's about 1,600 acres on the two campuses. So, um, you know, I've lived this dilemma. And it really is a dilemma because I fervently believe that one of the biggest responsibilities of an academic institution is for there to be freedom of speech and for faculty, students, and staff probably not presidents, <laughs> but faculty and student staff to have true academic freedom. To say, to ask difficult questions, to say things that might be difficult to hear. Ideally, universities ought to be safe spaces, not in the <laughs> definition that you mentioned, but places where those things should happen. Because uh, difficult debates, sometimes heated debates, but always civil debates, um, are really necessary to expand one's perspective of the world. Usually arguments arise because you see the world or a question in a certain way, and you haven't, have the, haven't had a lived experience to understand another person's perspective. And it's not because you're a bad person, it's just because you haven't been exposed to that other point of view. And it is through the argument or dialogue always civil, that people expand their minds beyond their own bubble. And that is at the heart of what an institution should be. So you're right. Um, and you're right that in recent years that's been challenged. Um, there are, uh, at a former institution that I worked at, Emory University in Atlanta, just the fact that the, the name Trump was written on sidewalks in chalk resulted in a whole group of students at that university running to the president's office saying, it's hurting me to see the name Trump on the sidewalks. I kid you not, look it up. And I'm not making fun of them. They really feel that. And so that's result in, it resulted in a criticism, as you point out, in the demand for safe spaces and, and certain kinds of conversations, even certain kinds of words are wrong to have on campus. And, uh, and so for, for the cynic, they say these are, what do they call them? Uh, snowflakes, right? I don't call them that. Um, that's a little bit dangerous because uh, I think part of what's happening is our responsibility as the older generation in how we've brought up our kids, how we've uh, run to their aid whenever, whenever they trip. Um, we have formed you and your generation and you are a diverse group of people. Obviously, you're not that kind of person because you're bringing up this question. But uh, we cannot call them snowflakes. We cannot mock them because many of them are experience, experiencing tremendous anxiety and mental health issues. And it's not because of them. It's because of how we raise them and the, the, the civilization, the environment that we've created. So it's not appropriate, and I've written about this in the Globe and Mail, to call them snowflakes. In fact... Uh, they're anything but that. Your generation has shown in leaving school south of the border and protesting against the lack of gun control that your generation is anything but snowflakes, that you are willing to stand up against governments for what you think is right. So why have I lived this dilemma? Well, when you're the president of a university or a community, and there's this tension that you point out between freedom of speech, 
academic freedom, difficult conversations, the reality of people being anxious and genuinely afraid of these situations. And in some cases, their fears are born to be true. Remember back to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, where there was a class that resulted in someone dying. It happened south of the border at the University of Washington, at the University of California, Berkeley. Sometimes it costs several hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars to, to provide the kind of security so people are not hurt, so that people don't die in the defense of freedom of speech and academic freedom. You see, the reason why this is a dilemma is because um, although we stand firmly for freedom of speech and academic freedom, that civility has been lost. The answer is not to make fun of students to call them snowflakes because their mental situation is real and we have a responsibility to care for them. What we have to address um, is why have we changed as a civilization so that we have become a less just society? And I would argue, coming back to this, the theme of this talk, is that part of it is the erosion in the liberal arts and the commitment to thinking about what those who preceded us, the mistakes that we've made, and, and not learning uh, through those liberal arts um, to develop empathy, cross-cultural understanding, and all those sorts of things. So I hope that's sort of an answer. It's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. And as someone who has lived in the moment where I have to decide, do I let the talk occur, even though some people are threatened by the talk? Do I let the talk occur, even though there's intelligence that there might be violence? If I say, it goes ahead, we try our very best for there to be security. Uh, but remember, as a president of the university, I have been faced by parents that have said to me, if you let that happen, the blood of my son or daughter is on your hands. It's not straightforward. I'm sorry, it's not an easy answer, but it hopes it gives you sort of an idea of the multidimensional problem and the dilemma that we face. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I want to thank Professor Ono most sincerely for his passionate advocacy of the liberal arts. So many of the things that he said tonight resonates so strongly, not only obviously with his vision of the mission of the university, but of the mission of the Catholic colleges here at UBC. Education of the heart, um, uh, expansive knowledge, breadth of education. You know, Cardinal Newman in his epic work on the idea of the university said that the role of the university is to educate students of the world for the world. And I think that that came through very clearly in his talk, and we're most grateful for the time that you spent with us tonight. And as a small token of our esteem, we have this gift of some swag from St. Mark's. <laughs> and a book of liberal arts. Thank you so much. We're almost done. I have to put in a plug for just a few upcoming events. Responding to Pope Francis' call for all Christians to engage a culture of, quote, encounter and dialogue, St. Mark's is pleased to announce the launch of our new Center for Christian Engagement. This will feature, starting at the end of this month, a two-part retreat jointly presented by Father Ronald Rohlheiser and Dr. Michael Higgins on May 25th on the topic of silence and contemplation, required tools for spiritual survival, and a spirituality of steadiness and sanity, keeping Sabbath and opening our lives to God, keeping acedia, anxiety, and unsteadiness at bay. On May 27th, Dr. Higgins will deliver a keynote presentation titled The Role of the Lady in the Reform of the Church, followed by a panel discussion with Father Rollheiser, Sister Sue Mosteller, co-founder of L'Arche uh, Daybreak in uh, Richmond Hill, Ontario with Jean Vanier. Um, Dr. Angus Reed and Dr. Linda Robitaille, Dean of Theology at St. Mark's. Finally, on May 28th, we will celebrate the third annual BC Jesuit Scotch Reception and Book Lunch. This will be an opportunity to meet with friends, 
to taste whiskey, to meet Jesuits, and to receive a copy of the new book, Spiritual Voices, to which Father Rollheiser, uh, Dr. Higgins, and Sister Sue have all made contributions. If you're interested in more information, staff representatives will have more information on the back table as you leave. Finally, thank you so much for being here. Please join us out in the courtyard and in Plato's Cave for our reception immediately following. Thank you so much.